Afterpay is a leading global retail technology platform offering consumers the flexibility to buy now and pay later. Brands have seen an increase in conversion rates, higher AOV, and lower return rates. Join the over 48,800 global fashion, beauty, and lifestyle retailers who have partnered with Afterpay today. Hello, this is Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion. And welcome to uh, the latest episode of BOF Live. Today, I am thrilled to have Jose Nevis with us, uh, the CEO and founder of Farfetch. And uh, Jose um, and I go way back because we met when we were both starting our businesses. So um, it's been really amazing to see Farfetch change, grow and develop over the years. And I have a lot of questions for Jose today. And I know a lot of you have questions as well. So hopefully we'll get to some of those questions towards the end of the call. But I just wanted to start by welcoming you, Jose. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. The pleasure. It's been a little while since we last spoke. Yeah, exactly. It's been, I don't know, maybe way pre-lockdown. Um, I mean, first of all, Jose, I just wanted to check, like, so have you been in London throughout the lockdown period? How have you been spending your time? Yeah, I'm, I'm in London. Um, uh, it's um, the usual, um, lots of work. And I think we're, we're doing what everyone else is doing, working from home and, um, and uh, you know, facing um, all the changes and the challenges that the, the times uh, are bringing all of us. But um, the team um, is incredible and uh, we've been able to uh, keep it all keep it all going so thank you yeah um and i mean as you said it's been a really rocky period for you know pretty much everybody and you know our industry in particular has been hit pretty hard and over the past years you know farfetch as well has gone through so many ups and downs so there's a lot to cover um but just first of all i thought you know it would be good to start by just getting a general business performance update from you. I know you've recently released some um, new quarterly figures. Just give us a sense of, as a business, how Farfetch uh, has been performing in this in this complicated situation. Sure, um, it's it's been a, a learning, a constant learning, because actually. Um, it all started in, in January for us, January and February. We, we have a very large uh, business in China, in Japan, uh, Korea as well. Um, and so we were quite alert um, since the very early days and um, also managing our teams in, in China um, and Japan through uh, the early days of the crisis. And, and then as the crisis uh, started spreading uh, with the lockdown in Italy, and um, at the end of February, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was 27th, it was very end of February. Um, and, then, and then obviously the rest of Europe and the US, um, it, it's, it's been uh, an incredible learning for us. And, um, uh, and you know, we've, we've fared, uh, I'd say very, very well, and we've been able to support uh, the boutiques, the brands that are on the platform at the, at the crucial time where online is uh, for many the main channel and, and for, for some for a period was the only channel and uh, and the focus has been on maintaining operational capabilities um, and continuing to execute on our mission which is um, to be the, the platform for the global fashion industry. So. Um, the performance has been very solid. It it, uh, it actually accelerated in, in Q2 versus Q1. We ended Q1 uh, with almost 20% uh, growth uh, on a like-for-like -like basis um, on the digital platform. Uh, the, this um, is actually accelerating um, in Q2 to 20, accelerated in Q2 to 25 to 30%. That's the range we've, uh, we've given the, the markets. Um, and we're very, very pleased. It's, it's been um, a challenge to um, obviously keep operations. And um, uh, we, thanks to our distributed logistics model, where we're picking 
we don't have a centralized warehouse or two or three or five. Um, we have thousands of uh, inventory points in 50 different countries. Uh, and that has allowed us uh, to maintain uh, a fantastic customer service. In, in fact, with um, almost no change to the to the service levels, um, and in turn has uh, helped us um, help the community, uh, keeping boutiques going, keeping brands going, uh, brands that have multinational operations. Um, if they were for some reason um, shut down in some countries, uh, we were able to uh, keep shipping orders from other. Uh, stock points. So the algorithm uh, was automatically switching on and off the, the SKUs that were available, not available. And even at SKU level, 85% of our products have more than one seller, uh, which which means that from a consumer perspective, uh, th th there was no interruption really in terms of, of the service or the range. And that uh, that I think reflects in the in the very very strong performance, which we're um, obviously I uh, I'm very uh, thankful to my team for for what has been an Herculean, like amazing, amazing, relentless work, um, and very happy that we continue to be able to support the the fashion community through this uh, crisis. Yeah, I mean, in a way, the fact that your inventory, as you say, is distributed across a lot of different, um, you know, hundreds of different places, it really distributes your risk. So when one region shuts down. Um, other parts of the world are still open. I mean, what's been the most challenging part of this period, Jose? Because clearly the business is continuing to perform well, but there's been a lot of challenges for everybody in some form or another. What, what's been the biggest challenge? I think that the, our first priority from day one was uh, the health, the well-being, the safety of, uh, of the fire fetches. Um, the, the community, the boutiques, the brands, the customers, um, a lot um, has, of effort and has been put on, on that front. Um, most of us can productively work from home at Farfetch. We're, we're an online company, uh, but we do have um, frontline workers uh, in our photo studios, for example, um, uh, and also some of the warehouses. So we have fulfillment by Farfetch, which adds six global warehouses where sellers can consign the, the merchandise and we can ship from there. They're not owned uh, by us. They're operated by third parties, but we absolutely wanted to make sure that they were following, following and exceeding uh, all government guidance, which we, we were able to. And as a result, even those haven't stopped operations. So I think the operations, uh, for example, customer service shifting from, you know, we, we don't outsource customer service. We do, we, it's very important that if a customer calls about a Valentino dress, the, the person answering the phone knows who Valentino is, right? And, mm -hmm. and so we, we never outsource uh, uh, those crucial parts of the customer experience, uh, but the systems and the tools and, and, and security and POS compliance, um, et cetera, et cetera, they were all set up for um, in-office um, working. So we had to very, very quickly switch we started with China, we switched to, to WeChat, uh, which, which is um, great for the consumer. And we were able to do it at an enterprise level with all levels of PCI compliance, et cetera. And the same, the same then followed in the, in the West. So I think operational, uh, the operational complexity of the business uh, required an incredible effort from, from our teams. We're, we're operating at the global level, 190 countries that we service from 50 countries. Uh, so keeping uh, all of that going was the biggest challenge. Uh, the model is, um, we have found out, um, uh, resilient to, to, to this crisis. We, uh, on the demand side, um, because we are a global business, we were able to shift um, the focus uh, to markets where sentiment was recovering. Uh, that started with China, who started China, Japan, and Korea, who started uh, recovering first. Um, during Q2, we saw phenomenal performance in the, in the Middle East and Europe. Uh, the US is, as we all know, a little bit behind, but we're also confident. So, uh, so from a supply side, it was really operations and logistics and making sure we were supporting the 300 um, partners that at some point were offline and how could we get them online safely as fast as possible. And also from a morale point of view, you know, how could we help them 
keep the morale up and, and, and giving them all the data and all the information they, they needed to get ready as soon as they open to, uh, to service again our customers, uh, over 2 million customers that we have on the platform. So on the demand side, it's a very, very flexible model because um, we, we're able to go after demand wherever demand is. Even in terms of marketing budgets, uh, we're able to very, very quickly in real time um, shift that demand offer. And, and that has uh, proven to be crucial during the crisis. And um, obviously what we're seeing is, is huge engagement uh, with the platform. To give you an idea, traffic is up 60% year on year. Um, app downloads are more than 100%, more than double uh, in Q2 versus Q2 last year. So extremely, extremely strong performance from an engagement level. And that is also translating to sales with around 25% to 30% growth um, in this last quarter. So um, again, um, you know, this is not over and uh, we need to keep, you know, being very, very alert and very agile. Uh, but the focus continues to be supporting uh, boutiques, brands, especially the small ones. We've uh, launched a campaign called Hashtag uh, Support Boutiques, where we brought boutiques to the forefront of our editorial, our social, uh, social media presence, um, and really, you know, told their stories uh, throughout this very, very hard period and drove more sales in terms of the sales mix uh, to them um, as a priority. And, and we, I know that if I'm supporting small boutiques, I'm supporting small brands uh, because small brands, they are practically, you know, 100% wholesale uh, with very few directly operated stores. And they are relying today um, in these boutiques more than ever before, uh, since obviously department stores have also been uh, having their own difficulties. Um, so for us, it's not just about the boutiques, it's um, directly almost um, also about the brands. 500 brands are selling on the platform as well. Um, we thought from a consumer perspective, it was clearer if we said hashtag support boutiques, but the way we see it is hashtag support small fashion businesses and, and you know, all that ecosystem that goes around them. Mm -hmm. You know, Jose, you know, we've been talking to a lot of brands in the market over the last few months and obviously, you know, directly or indirectly, they're all present on Farfetch, but one of the concerns that many of them have is uh, discounting. And, you know, right now in the market, you know, you know, rightly or wrongly, Farfetch is seen as one of the players in the market that's doing a lot of discounting. And so while you're giving exposure to some of these brands, some of them are also worried that, you know, the heavy discounting that we see in order to clear inventory, obviously, that's been accumulating uh, over this period is doing damage to their brands over the long term, and you know, some of them are saying they don't want to be on Farfetch anymore. How do you respond to 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 the brands who are who are uncomfortable with the the level of discounting that you're putting into the platform right now? I'm glad you you asked the question um, because I think that there is a level of um, uh, work we have to do in terms of educating the industry, not not necessarily the consumer, but the industry on the nature of the business model. So we do not set prices. Um, where we do set prices, uh, which is uh, Brown's our, which is 10% of the business. So 90% is marketplace and 10% is, is the Brown's business. Brown's actually went down the route of zero discounts. So you will not find, even today, you go on brownsfashion.com, you go on the Brown stars, we're not zero. Um, and I say today because we're in July and every, everyone's obviously on markdown. Um, uh, where, where we do not control the prices, which is 90% of our business, uh, legally, we really um, have no, um, no interference, we have no, uh, no power to tell people to discount or not to discount. Um, and of course, we, we are in the luxury industry. We indeed, I come from this industry. I, I'm from the days um, I started my brand, shoe brand in 1996. I, I remember sales were um, after Christmas, Boxing Day, right? So that's completely unthinkable to have anything before. Um, and, 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 uh, and also, you know, we work with mostly a big percentage, more than, than half of our supply is European, it's French, Italian, um, and they don't have a discount culture because um, in these markets it's even illegal to discount. In, in 
France and Italy before certain dates, which I think is great. Um, so I, I think, you know, uh, of course, when retailers build up inventory, there is going to be an incentive to discount. And where when discounts are pervasive to the whole industry, um, of course, those retailers are losing competitivity and, and they tend to follow. And, uh, and of course, we see that, that behavior on, on the platform. And, and then it's an exercise of liaising with the brands, liaising with retailers to the extent we can, obviously, as a marketplace, um, in order to, to keep those, those channels of communication flowing. The brands, you've, you've, you mentioned the brands, the brands are joining uh, Farfetch en masse. Um, we, we had more brands joining the platform in the last um, not even COVID in the in the last three quarters, four quarters than uh, than any time before. Um, we have 100% brand retention um, of the top 100 brands, but if it's the top 200, top 300, I think it's very 99. percent. So we we essentially uh, don't lose brands, um, and uh, and that's a result of being really close to them and listening to them and and servicing them as as uh, as sellers on the platform. Um, we are also having new brands, new brands that um, until today, they were still uh, thinking about online, that they were still thinking about a, a marketplace, a platform environment, uh, and that have accelerated conversations with us. And, um, and the same thing with department stores, which is another segment that we, um, uh, that, that we are um, expanding to. So we've launched um, Harrods on their own uh, platform powered by us, the Harrods.com. Uh, website. Uh, we that was a global launch. It happened in February, which was very timely, mm -hmm. uh, as we were able to support them in this uh, very difficult period. So overall, um, we we keep this dialogue and we keep this um, job, which is our job of educating uh, the industry on our model and how it works. What can we do? What 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 we cannot do? Um, uh, but overall, I think I see um, brand relationships are, are stronger than ever before. And I actually am very, very pleased that um, some forecasts, some people estimated, and we were worried, frankly, that Q2 was going to be a, a very heavy discounting quarter um, these last few months. Uh, and we haven't seen that. So both from department stores, e-tailers, um, and, and that, that has been great, which, which has mean the, there was less, much less pressure on, on, on the retailers that are on our platform to follow these, these promotional activities. Um, so we've, we, we, uh, that translates in higher margins for us as well. So we have a margin um, that is uh, higher year on year uh, compared with Q2 last year, where there was uh, a lot of promotional activity. Uh, so we see uh, the situation improving uh, greatly, actually, through this period, which is something that uh, we were uh, worried about, but it's, it's not happening, which is good news. Yeah, as we look ahead to Q3, um, it seems like a lot of people are expecting the discounting to increase further. So have you got any visibility now on how some of this you know, excessive discounting activity might play out in the coming months? Because you're right, I think a lot of people are really worried about aggressive discounting. And it sounds like a lot of, you know, at least in the conversations I've been having, a lot of people were pointing at Farfetch and maybe you know, there's some work to do in explaining how, how, how it works in, in so far as you say you don't have control over the prices. But you know, no matter what, as you look ahead to Q3 and and you know some of this inventory still needs to be cleared because understandably there's still a lot there. What what are you expecting to happen now? Um, look, I think you know. So we we have two types of sellers in the marketplace. So we have the brands selling directly on the market marketplace. Um, we have 500 brands at the, at the moment. Um, we have um, almost all the brands in the carrying group. Gucci, Balenciaga, Saint Laurent. We have many um, from LVMH, Fendi, uh, Pucci, many others. We have obviously Burberry, Prada, um, and it's it's then five hundred of them. So we have also uh, many uh, really high quality, incredible um, uh, up and coming uh, designers. Uh, for those sellers, they completely set the prices. Again, we're a marketplace. Uh, many of them opt to do zero discounts on Farfetch, which we're absolutely fine with. That's never, 
pressure on us for a brand to to be competitive or this or that it's it's completely up to them and and we have many that use farfetch as an exclusive um uh, full price um and others most many of them have you know 85 percent um full price uh, ratios on platform which which at, at retail comparables it's it's incredible uh, then we have the retailers right and the retailers do have the, the pressure in terms of stock that that has built up um i think you know i'm not too worried about spring summer 20 because we are now in what is always you know the full-on you know clearance not clearance but but discount season and leading to the clearance in, in a few weeks time so i think what what had to happen already happened in spring summer 20. so what we're looking now is is, is autumn winter 20 um which is starting extremely extremely strong and obviously full price because it, it's the beginning of the season and um, and I think because of uh, COVID-19, the level of inventories for autumn winter is lower. There will be less pressure. So I think we've seen the, the there's, you know, spring, summer, it is what it is. It wasn't as bad as, as we feared. Um, autumn winter is a completely new season. And, and, and what I see is, is very strong health in terms of the sell throughs on our platform for, for autumn winter 20. And I, we see levels of supply which are much more balanced. Um, and we know that department stores have canceled a bunch of orders. Um, um, we know retailers have canceled a bunch of orders. So, so I think the level of supply is going to, is going to be much, much um, healthier, which is good news for the industry. I do think the industry had an oversupply uh, problem, uh, which is an environmental problem as well. By the way, we're doing in terms of, of really powerful things on sustainability side, which maybe we'll get to we that in a bit. About. Yeah, uh, but uh, I think you know the, we we I think on the side of pricing and pricing discipline, I think we're clear. Uh, we're we're as an industry, I think we're we're now facing a much more disciplined, healthy environment um, going forward. And, and so that's good to hear because I think, as you said, there's been kind of a lack of discipline around discounting that, you know, you know, frankly, not good for anybody uh, in the ecosystem. But what does that mean for Farfetch specifically and your path to profitability? So, you know, 25 to 30% growth at a time when most of the market has been contracting. Um, you know, how, what are you now telling the market with regards to your timing to hit uh, profitability so that you no longer have to take um, outside financing. Um, yeah, so we're, we're very confident that profitability is in sight. Um, we've uh, we've told the markets it's a 2021 uh, objective that we're committed to, um, and we're faring very very well um, as we indicated. You're still on track for that. Absolutely, absolutely, and and has as as we indicated. Well, Q1 we were beating guidance, both top line and bottom line, on the profitability level. Um, and Q2, the indications we gave the market were also better than guidance. So, which means we're essentially accelerating. So that path, that path to profitability in 2021 is uh, is accelerating as per our market updates. But um, yeah, I think we've, the team has executed incredibly well in terms of margins, in terms of uh, leveraging the, the fixed cost base, the investments. Um, we have invested deliberately, you know, with building we have 400 people in, in China. We have an office in Tokyo. We have an office in Dubai. Um, uh, we have an office in Moscow. We have an office in Sao Paulo. We have offices in the US. Building a global business that operates in 15 languages, you know, 190 countries, 50 countries from the supply side is expensive. And we, we have deliberately invested in this. Um, and, and that hits the, the P&L immediately. This is not like a, a, a shop that you amortize over X number of years. This is like hits the PNL immediately, but this, these are upfront investments that we are, um, that are paying off in space. And, and the, the resilience of the model um, has, has proven that investing in this um, international expansion and this, in this platform capabilities was the right thing to do. Have you had to make any adjustments to your cost structure in this period? It sounds like, you know, you're investing a lot and the business is growing. Has there been any reduction in cost where you thought, given this environment, maybe we're gonna, you know, slow down some of our investment. I know, for example, 
Farfetch has traditionally spent a lot of money on customer acquisition, um, which, you know, I, I understand over years, you know, can become very, very expensive. How, you know, where, if any, are you doing cost reductions? Um, so we, um, so we took a decision to not furlough anyone, including our retail employees. And we have retail shops, we have Browns, we have Stadium Goods, we have NGG, Off-White and other, uh, and other shops, uh, which have been closed uh, for you know, pretty long time. And we've decided not to furlough anyone um, uh, at all in the business. And, and obviously not to resort to any of the government um, instruments um, in Europe or, or the US. So we haven't um, really resorted to any governmental help. Uh, I do feel that we need to leave that to um, smaller businesses and, and, and bigger businesses, even if unprofitable like ours should have that responsibility. We have access to finance that, that those businesses don't have. Um, we have um, uh, phased um, out some investments um, in, in Q1 and Q2, um, but we haven't lost sight of our mission. And the mission is to build the global platform for luxury. Uh, and this is an industry that is in, in its infancy. It, it's a $300 billion industry, less now because it's contracting, but still a very, very large industry. And online is 12% of sales. So 88% is still conducted in physical stores. Um, if you think China is now a $70 billion repatriation opportunity, $70 billion was spent by Chinese while traveling. They're not traveling now. And, and to the extent that spending remains, it will have to be in, the, in domestic uh, purchases, which in turn will have to be primarily digital uh, because even, even the, you have, you know, even the large conglomerates, um, they, they, they cannot cover the 600 cities that, that China has with, with millions of, uh, of, of inhabitants. So, so online is, is the only way you can service the sophisticated Chinese customer that really wants the European, the American supply that we're used to, to find. They want that range. They want that, that and range of brands as well, because we're not talking only about the big brands. And that won't be serviced by the physical uh, networks in, in China. So uh, all of this demands investment. So we're not taking the, the, the foot off the pedal. Uh, we did phase some of the investments out, as we, uh, we told the markets. Um, that is um, helping us accelerate the path to profitability, um, but we're not going to compromise future growth uh, for short-term rationalization. That makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm keen to understand then, you know, you, you used 12% of luxury sales are online now, and everyone's been talking about you know, coronavirus is a kind of great accelerator. And, you know, maybe even in the period that we've just concluded the you know, second quarter of 2020, I mean, online sales and luxury must have been well north of 50% of the consumption, albeit smaller consumption. You know, do you think that this is going to accelerate the path towards this kind of 25, 30% of sales in the luxury sector being online? And how quickly do you think we could get there? Um, I do think it will accelerate. Um, if, you, if you look at you know, the contraction of the industry in Q2, which we still don't know where it, it will land, but it, it will be a pretty severe contraction compared with 25% growth for us, for example, but I'm sure other digital platforms are, are seeing growth as well. Um, on, on actually a very difficult comp because last year we had grown 49% um, in Q2. So we, we, we were not expecting you know, this, this level of growth, especially through this uh, crisis. So I think there is a lot of customers uh, that are trying uh, to, to buy, that are buying online luxury for the, the first time. We, we have more new customers uh, in Q1 and Q2 than uh, at any point in our recent history, the past three years, you have to go back more than three years to have the same amount of new customers um, trying the platform. Um, and because of our service levels, uh, we know retention is very, very high. Uh, they're being well serviced, they're very happy. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people just didn't think of buying luxury online as, as, a, as an option. And now they're trying, they're liking it. Um, and I think it's not, it's just an acceleration of what already was going to happen. 
Um, and I do think that 30%, which um, the McKinsey's and the Bain's um, used to, uh, to, to put in 2025, um, it was 25% by 2025. They've now updated this. It's 30% by 2025. And I do believe in that, um, if not faster and if not a bigger share. Uh, so, and that's why we will keep investing and we will keep um, attracting new brands, uh, attracting new department stores uh, to make sure our range um, uh, is, is, um, is, continues to be attractive to this growing customer base. Um, and, uh, and we think this is a tremendous opportunity for, for everyone. In, industry for, for, for brands, boutiques, um, and, and retailers. Yeah. So in the online space in particular, then, is this, is this a matter of the kind of proverbial rising tide that raises all boats then? So, you know, how do you think, you know, the growth of Farfetch uh, will compare to your closest competitors like YNAP and Matches Fashion? And, you know, what, what makes what makes Farfetch different now? Because in the consumer's eyes, especially in a, an environment where everyone is price conscious, um, everyone's being much more, you know, considered about what they buy. You know, what, what, how does Farfetch carve out a differentiation in this market that's growing quickly? Um, I think, you know, um, uh, we're not really focused on, on what those businesses are doing in terms of performance. It is what it is. Um, um, we we uh, we don't we don't think there are uh, public numbers yet, but um, I think we're focused on on our business and what we can control. And what we can control is providing an unrivaled range to our um, customers. We have three thousand four hundred designers represented on the platform. Um, we have um, around three hundred SKUs uh, represented on the platform. Uh, we want to photograph them beautifully. We want to create great content in 15 languages. We want to service customers with 90 minutes delivery in um, in almost 10 cities, um, same day delivery in almost 20 cities, which is completely unrivaled, um, and and this you know completely um, global omnichannel experience that we're we're providing. Um, we're making advances on sustainability, for example, we've launched, and this is an example of where we continue to invest. So we've invested in offsetting um, the carbon footprint of all our deliveries. So all deliveries and returns on Farfetch um, are 100% carbon offset. And uh, this is an investment, obviously financial investment, but also an operational and, um, and data-driven investment that we pushed through and we launched in April. Uh, we're investing in the circular economy as well. We, we, uh, we have a, a product called Second Life where customers can uh, send their handbags to us to get immediate credit from Farfetch. Uh, we have a second, um, a pre-owned um, business that is growing very, very fast. Uh, so so we're, we're investing in, in many, many fronts on, on the sustainability side because we think that is important for this new uh, customer and this and we are already thought I think again this is an acceleration this is not new we've been investing in sustainability for a number of years now uh, but we think consumers will be more conscious today we have an unrivaled range um, of 160 conscious brands uh, you can shop them by using a filter on Farfetch if you want to stick to um, to, to, to that uh, part of our edit uh, so making it easier for customers that that um, that are more conscious shoppers these days uh, to find products that, that they want to buy. Um, and, and, we, and, and we continue to focus also on the creativity side of the business, focusing on exclusives, um, on capsules, on launches. Uh, we've, um, Burberry just announced uh, they're going to, 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 to launch the new monogram uh, range um, exclusively on Firefetch as their exclusive online partner, which is, which is fantastic. They've they been fantastic partners of, of our business. Um, so, so really, you know, um, moving on all these fronts, on sustainability, on creativity, um, on service levels, on, you know, uh, flexible deliveries, if you want them ultra fast, ultra fast, um, if you want them, if you don't mind, slower, environmentally more friendly and, and cheaper uh, uh, as a consumer. So, um, so all of these fronts are important. The loyalty program is another example. Access, we have now 1.5 million 
members of our loyalty program, um, we, which is a phenomenal result since we, we launched one year ago. Uh, so moving on all these fronts is, um, is the focus for us. I wanted to touch on the sustainability point um, for a second because, and I have two questions. The first is in a way, I mean, I know when I've ordered a multi-product order from Farfetch, it comes from different places, right? So inherently in your model, I, I could place an order for five things and those five things might come from five different parts of the world, depending on what I've chosen. And instead of a single package that's delivered, you know, once, and it seems like there's a potential for a lot of streamlining there. I mean, have you thought about how you might simplify that? Because even, even from a customer journey perspective, say I ordered those five things and I decided I didn't want any of those five things, then those five things then have to be returned to five different places again. Like how can, how can that be better? Um, so f first of all, those deliveries are carbon offset, as I said, uh, but that's not good enough. We want to, to have less deliveries and less miles. Um, the, the way the algorithm and the way our business model works is that if there is an alternative, if you're trying to buy a pair of sneakers and they exist in London, that's where it's going to come from. And if you want to buy a pair of sneakers and a t-shirt, and if they exist from the same boutique or from the same brand or from the same fulfillment center, the, the, that's where we will ship it from. And this is thinking about the environment, but thinking, quite frankly, even about our cost base, right? Because it's much cheaper to put everything in a box and to send two boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and from a customer experience, it's better to receive one box and two boxes. Now, there's a trade-off because if you want to have 3,400 designers, we have designers that, that um, we source from Tokyo. They're only available in Tokyo. That's it. You know, like we have designers that we source from Brazil, like Oslo, for example, which I love. So um, that's it. So, uh, and, 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 and we have small designers that have their studios in Milan and they're shipping from their studios. They don't even have a physical store. If we want to make this range available, which we think we should, uh, that has a, a trade-off. And the trade-off is you will get more than one box. So that's, that's how we're balancing it. Uh, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, obviously, fulfillment by Farfetch, uh, we're incentivizing the retailers and the brands to use our localized fulfillment centers. We have one in LA, one in New York, one in Hong Kong, one in Shanghai, and uh, two in Europe as well, London and, and Italy. Um, so we're telling them, listen, 30% of your sales go to Asia anyway. Why do you have everything in France, right? So let's move 30% of that. We have data that shows exactly the skews with a good degree of approximation that you should have in Asia. Um, and so that's what we're doing. And so fast forward a few years, I think you will have uh, a fraction of the number of, uh, of boxes that, that you get. And that's, that's something that we're really uh, committed to again from a sustainability but also from a customer experience and cost uh, levels that makes sense the other thing that i wanted to touch on sustainability wise um i don't know if you saw what zalando has said but you know they recently made an announcement that there would be minimum benchmarks for the the brands that they actually stock from a sustainability perspective i mean that's quite a bold move because you know there could be lots of great brands out there that are just not operating at all in a sustainable manner, either because of the materials they use or the amount of water or energy they consume. Would you ever consider, you know, taking a step like that and saying, okay, you know, we are the mo one of the most powerful platforms uh, in this industry. And if we, you know, set some, because there's no global regulations in our industry, right? I mean, I've, it's something I've, we've been thinking a lot about at BOF, which is like one way to get this industry, which is inherently unsustainable, is to have some kind of regulation. But, it, you know, a, a proxy for that could be Farfetch saying, okay, you know, if you want to be on this platform, you need to meet these minimum basic requirements um, that we believe will make you more sustainable. Uh, so we, we are working on our long-term sustainability commitments. Uh, watch the space. I think we will, we will be able to communicate um, uh, in the very near future. Um, we, and we, th we thought about, uh, about the issue of rating brands and rating products. Um, and, and also the, the, how could we leverage the power of the platform to influence the industry and be a positive force in the, in the right direction. 
Um, some things we have already done. So we've partnered with um, our accelerator alumni, um, uh, Good On You. It's an Australian startup. Uh, and they have an amazing, very comprehensive, very solid system to uh, rate brands and within brands rate products. So we've partnered with them. So if you go on Farfetch and if you click on um, Positively Conscious, the, the Conscious Edit, um, it's powered by Good On You. So it's not even our data. We, we use very strong, very solid data combined with our data that, that really delivers that, that option. As a customer, you can influence the industry in a, in, in a very concrete way. Um, going a, a step further, so we have other, other um, you know, commitments in terms and, and standards in terms of sustainability, no fur policy, um, et cetera. I think then our, our and, and this I am very passionate about, we should not point fingers and we should be uh, educational in our efforts. When I say we, I believe Farfetch, but I also think other platforms and other retailers. It shouldn't be about either this or, right? Especially if we're a platform, right? Because we're a platform for the entire creative community. As, as you said, we have designers that just came out of graduate school. And to ask a designer to rate there, to fill hundreds of pages of, you know, like go all the way to where the Italian factory, where they got a great favor and they produced the 20 pieces that they that are going to keep their business alive. Are we going to burden those businesses with a lot of ratings and bureaucracy and all it's, it's a fine line. And so I do believe that platforms have a responsibility to in a strong way incentivize customers to shop consciously. By doing that, you create an incentive for brands to have to be more conscious or to be totally um, ethical and conscious and sustainable if they can, but we need to stop short of forcing people to um, either or, because we, we, we support, again, 3,400 designers, many of them, as, as you know, um, it, it's a matter of survival. They, uh, and, and, you know, uh, of course, there, there are certain standards that are absolutely non-negotiable in terms of um, ethical behavior and sourcing, etc. But Fortunately, we, we are in an industry where most of the production is done in, in Europe uh, and where the governments themselves have very strong regulations. So we, um, it's an industry where that problem is less pervasive than, than parts of the industry that produce in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, but, you know, we, we have a responsibility, but I, I think it should be a positive force um, uh, and, and, and should be designed in a way that we can help the community, we can educate the community, we can help the consumer, and by doing that, be a very assertive, but in a, in a positive way, as opposed to, to a negative way, if that makes sense. Well, well you may find, and I, I certainly do, that when you talk to the really small businesses and the, the new businesses, they're sometimes the most advanced in terms of thinking about building sustainability some of them, responsibility. Some of them into their businesses from scratch. But, but I take your point that, you know, you, Some of them. you, don't, want, you don't want to penalize um, really small businesses that are, you know, frankly, trying to survive right now. Um, before I open it up to questions, I, I did want to touch on one other topic, which is really around your M&A strategy. Um, you know, you, as you mentioned earlier, you know, there was Stadium Goods and New Guards Group. <clears throat> and, you know, very honestly speaking, I think when the New Guards Group announcement was made, um, it wasn't received particularly well by the markets because it was seen as a real, um, you know, deviation from the very, very clear focus, Jose, that you've always had about Farfetch as this marketplace and you know, you know, powering the fashion industry, and all of a sudden. There you guys were acquiring, by the way, a very strong and profitable business um, run by a very capable entrepreneur, uh, Davide Di Giglio, but a completely different business model. And so how, how, are, you, how are you trying to reconcile? Um, how are you trying to reconcile that now? Because, you know, clearly, you know, it's been accretive to your profits from what I've read, but also it's it's not particularly in line with the model that you first sold to the market? Um, you know, I, it's a great question. And, and the question I, I was asked, I think, 500 times by analysts and investors in the, in the past nine months. Um, and I, I do understand the, 
the the, the reaction and the questions. Um, um, I think that the first thing to to realize is what type what, what is NGG and and the way I see it and actually the way you've brilliantly chronicled it in an interview with Avide, uh, who's I completely agree, an amazing entrepreneur, together with Andrea and, and the rest of the team. Um, they're a platform, and this is before even Farfetch was talking to them. And they see themselves as a platform. They have a, um, a, a, a common infrastructure in terms of design, in terms of the sales, the marketing, the, the showrooms, sometimes individual showrooms, but powered by the same back office team, same industrial um, platform team. Um, and so for me, it's like they're Pixar. And yes, they have Toy Stories, which is fantastic, and Monsters, Inc. And now they're on to the next one and then to the next one. And, and to me, it's really about original content and this idea um, that I firmly believe in that consumer-facing platforms, such as Firefetch, sooner or later need to have an element of original content. And I think the best analogies is Netflix, right? So Netflix started aggregating an industry um, and at the point, there was an inflection point in their, in their journey where they said, if we continue to be just an aggregator of content that everyone else has, this, this is going to be difficult in terms of margin, but in terms of customer acquisition, in terms of retention and building a brand. So how do we build a brand? Um, and obviously that inflection point was very brave. No one liked it uh, at the time. Uh, it consumes much more capital than, than in the fashion industry, because obviously, um, entertainment, you have upfront costs, uh, creation of content, etc. But it created the the you know the, the hundred billion plus company we know today. I don't think they would be around if they were still a standardized catalog. You have another another example, Spotify. Um, they've, they've invested um, hundreds of millions or maybe billions by now of dollars buying and creating podcasts. And everyone asked Daniel, so like, you are crazy. You have this brilliant business. You're aggregate, you finally convinced the music, the music industry to be on your platform. You're killing it uh, and winning against Apple. So wh why are you in this podcast business? And it's very, 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 very simple. They cannot differentiate themselves in the music industry. It's just not the way it works. So what, what do you listen to that can be really differentiated? And that's podcasts and content. That's one way of differentiating. Um, so you see consumer brands that start as aggregator platforms at the point moving to, uh, to become partially creators of content themselves. And that's the way we see NGG. And, um, uh, and you know, it won't be, uh, you know, by the scale of the Farfetch business. I mean, we, we ended the year uh, on the digital side, on the, the car business with close to $2 billion in net sales. So the NGG is big, but is relatively small, right? Especially on the digital front. Um, so it will, it continues to be a 90% third party marketplace. And that's where the market got it wrong because they thought, oh, suddenly they're going to completely change the model. No, it's the same model, but we're enriching it with an element of original content. Uh, and, you know, almost one year on, I'm so happy we did that acquisition. We knew it was going to be challenged and we knew probably the stock price would, would tank, but that's okay. We're, we're running this business for, for the next 20, 30 years. Um, and, uh, and this has been extraordinarily positive for the designers are very happy. Um, the NGG team is super happy. They, they're fastly increasing their, their digital capabilities, which again proved instrumental uh, during this crisis. Uh, we're, we're servicing uh, as a platform for new creatives and, and also brands that are uh, still small, like Opening Ceremony, Ambush, which we welcome to, the, to that umbrella uh, in the beginning of the year. But we think they have a ton, tons of potential. And if they have that Netflix, that digital distribution channel, that will accelerate these, these creatives um, in, in a substantial way. So, so for us, it's, it's really buying the studio and then creating original content to the benefit of the creative community mm -hmm. um, and to the benefit of consumers as well. Yeah. Well, I guess investors weren't really happy, Jose, um, <laughs> but how, how are they feeling about it now? I mean, you said you spent nine months or so answering really tough questions about this acquisition. I mean, are they buying into this? We're like Netflix narrative that you just you know, laid out for us. Uh, well, my, my duty is to humbly, respectfully update investors and explain the rationale to the extent we, we can as a public company. 
um, and, and and obviously we we do that a lot. Um, uh, and, and then they will make their own decisions, and we'll we'll see. Uh, but we I'm, I'm extremely happy with the integration and the execution. We've launched, uh, we've just launched Open Ceremony, by the way, to all those uh, in the audience that that love the brand like like I do for many many years since very early days uh, when Carol and Umberto started it. Um, so we've just launched their their new website. Uh, we're giving digital capabilities to all of these designers, um, and and that has having a tremendous effect on uh, on on customer acquisition. Our biggest day ever on the platform uh, was the Nike Off White drop, um, the latest drop, the Air Jordan Fives, and we had 16 million hits per minute, uh, which was bigger than the la the biggest day in in 2019 uh, with zero marketing spend. So there's a, there's this incredible magnet in terms of customer um acquisition and and traffic and, and and also then customer retention because the amount of things we can do with these brands which is to mutual benefit of brand and customer and and the platform um is is incredible so and and we think the you know eventually uh, the story will be understood okay thank you jose um so we have a couple of questions that i wanted to go to from our community the first question is from olia uh, who's in San Francisco. So let's just wait for Olya to come up here. Hello, Hi. Olya. Hello, Hi. how are you? Well, Very thank you so much. You. Hello, pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Yes. Go ahead. What's your oh, question? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Um, I really enjoy the conversation. You know, um, you did answer a lot, a uh, big part of the question. However, you know, since um, the market has been, the retail market has been really hit with um, COVID uh, from both sides, from consumer sides and small businesses, as said, and those are the two people and two ma major groups that you are pertaining to. Um, basically, I would love to know how did it really hit the small boutiques and businesses? Have you lost a lot of partnerships in terms of that? And another very small question uh, is that in terms of the consumer purchasing power right now, and as we know, there's not a lot of luxury brands that uh, people are very interested in right now because of the uncertainty of when we're gonna go outside and how everything is gonna happen. Uh, did your uh, trends in terms of buying, which trend, uh, which brands are you buying and what trends are you going after with the situation today? Have they changed based on your projections from before? Great. Thanks, Alia. Um, so in terms of the boutiques, we're very happy that actually, you know, the boutiques have um, managed to uh, weather the storm so far, and we have seen very few, very, very few, um, almost immaterial number of closures. Um, we haven't seen any leave the platform, on the contrary, because we, we have been for many of them throughout the period, the only channel that they had, and, and still today, um, a substantial channel, if not the main channel. Um, we've been absolutely focused in helping them, um, in all ways possible. Uh, for example, when, when Italy started the, the lockdown, we were transferring inventory from the boutiques that could not uh, safely keep in so, social distance service uh, those, uh, those deliveries to our fulfillment center in Treviso. Um, and we were then trying to do the same in other parts of the world. Uh, we've featured boutiques extensively in our social media. They became the heroes of our homepages and our editorial content. Um, visual merchandising, emails, algorithms, ranks, we've, we've really pushed them to the, to the top, um, which, which was incredibly successful. So we managed to uh, grow the business substantially um, uh, on that side, so to the tune of 20% in Q1 and 25 to 30% in Q2. And so that's, that's going to continue to be the, the, the focus. Um, uh, the, we're doing the same with brands, by the way. So again, we have 500 brands using the platform, 3,400 represented between direct e-concessions and, and the boutique business. Um, and we're focused on the small ones um, uh, primarily because the, they, they are the ones that need the, the most help in this uh, period of time. 
Um, so your second question around consumer sentiment, uh, this is something we're, we're monitoring and it's very, um, of course, people started buying different categories or shifted to different categories. People are not buying evening wear, cocktail dresses, uh, tailored uh, stuff. They, they're, they're going more for stay at home clothes, um, uh, streetwear, athleisure, um, you know, more comfortable clothes in, in general and, and shoes. Um, so we've seen a category uh, mix change. Uh, we don't influence the buying directly because 90% um, of our business is marketplace model. So we, uh, we're, um, we're listing the merchandise that boutiques have pre-selected, uh, but we do give, give them all of this data. So this, this is data that we pass on to them um, and then they try to adjust as fast as they can. Obviously this industry is not very fast at reacting because the cycles are relatively slow. Um, but um, they, they have, we've seen now in autumn, winter 20, already a shift to, to a slightly different category mix. Great. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you for you. your question. Our, our final thank question you. is going to be from James Nakajima. And I actually don't know where James is based. So we will ask him when he joins. Hi, James. Hi there. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us, Jose. Um, so my question was kind of, you know, you describe, I really liked your description of Farfetch acquiring NGG and stadium goods as similar to kind of Netflix producing original content. Um, but if you kind of see it that way, do you see Farfetch eventually competing with the likes of LVMH and Kirin, um the way that Netflix does with Disney and HBO? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I, we did ask the question. Um, we, as, as you know, Virgil um, is a creative director of Louis Vuitton. So there was a, you know, a conversation with, with the group. Um, and, and we also asked you know, some very few, but very strategic um, CEOs. And I was very um, enthused actually. And, and it, it, it confirmed what I thought, which they, they, essentially they told me, listen, we are on Farfetch because you are a multi-brand environment mm -hmm. uh, and because you have the best brands you have the coolest customers you have the best products this acquisition just reinforces that so we're as happy or even more happy that if you are investing in original content exclusive content um excitement um bigger customer engagement higher elevation of the of the image of the brand and the platform uh we're we're going to continue to double down on farfetch so um, and the other thing, this is a very fragmented industry. It's a very large industry, three hundred billion dollars. Mm. Uh, even the largest brands have what four percent market share, three percent market share, and then it drops to one one percent market share. It's a huge brand, it's a three billion dollar brand. How many brands are three billion dollar brands? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Almost none. So, so it's a very very long tail industry, um, which means there's space for everyone. There's space for creativity, new concepts. And so we felt very strongly that this wasn't a conflict of interest. On the contrary, it was a way of, of extending, how can I extend the platform to the creative community, right? So we already have a platform that services boutiques. That's how we started. We then service brands and then we then service department stores. How can we go upstream or downstream, whatever way you want to call it, to the creative community um, you know, people like Carolyn Umberto from Opening Ceremony and uh, Herbal and Yoon from, uh, from Ambush and, uh, and in the future potentially others. And how can we offer them a Netflix of luxury that they, they can create beautiful things and have them distributed instantaneously pretty much to 2 million plus customers uh, from, from China and Japan to, to Brazil and, and Mexico. So, um, so for me, this, this was again, a positive uh, force for, for the entire industry uh, and something we validated with our partners. And since then, actually, we've seen, an ex as I said before, an acceleration of brands joining the platform. Okay. It's a great Thank question. You so Thank much. you, James. Thank Thanks for your question, James. And Thank Jose, we, we've, I think we have so many questions. I think we could keep going for a few more hours because people are so curious about Farfetch, but sadly, we ran out of time. So maybe we'll schedule a part two for later this year and catch up again. I'm, I'm super grateful um, for your really honest answers uh, and for your um, optimism um, that you've given me about the rest of the year. So let's, let's see what happens. 
Thank you. Thanks a lot, Imran. And uh, it was a great pleasure. Thanks to everyone asking questions and hope to see you soon. Yeah. So that's all for today. I'm Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion. That's it for BOF Live. Um, if you want to tune in for more live events next week, check out businessoffashion.com slash events. See you all later.